So again, we'll wait for Augusto, Abigail, um, and the likes to turn on your cameras. Thank you, Ever. Um, um, I sent you a message that. Uh, my fault, Augusto. You're good. If you already sent me a message, don't worry about it. But um, I believe Lena. I don't know if you sent me a message already. Also, I think you have. Let me see. I did. Yeah. Okay. Cool. 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 All right. Um, Amanda, is your computer working? No, it's not. The uh, camera is like not working for some reason, but I'm trying to fix that. Uh, if it's not working, don't worry about it. Um, all right, everyone else, we should be good then. Cool. So we'll get things started. So we had three breakout questions on the table. Um, first one being, what is my eye? Um, two, why is the elasticity of my eye important to understanding the concept of my eye? And then finally, what questions did you have about the reading? Uh, who would like to start? Uh, I guess I'll go, but uh, Ma'a is a concept about religion in Egypt, Egyptian ethics, sorry. Um, it's kind of like, like if you follow this religion, it'll lead you to like treasury, like richness of like meanings. And it's kind of like, um, not really like, like it's kind of like problematic at first, but like it's kind of like, once reading more into it, you're kind of like understanding the their like point of view of it. So what did you um, find to be problematic, Kevin? Uh, well, in the reading, it states that it is problematic from like, like the first page in like 1.2. Um, it doesn't really specify what problematic it is, but it says at first glance, it may seem problematic, but de on deeper inquiry, it proves promising. Yeah. Okay, I got you. That makes sense. I thought you were saying you personally felt that it was problematic, but I, I, I see what no, you're yeah. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Uh, who's next? Who else would like to share? Um, Ma'a was like a practice of like good and understanding the significance of the divine, social, and natural. Um, but Ma'a was uh, the goddess of truth, justice, balance, and uh, order, I think it was, something like that. Anyone else want to chime in on what my art was? Uh, go ahead, Ernesto. Um, I'm not going to be able to really say what my art was, but I just want to tie in with how Kevin and Angel were able to say those two statements. Uh -huh. I find it interesting how the people were able to find this, like, I don't know how to say that well, so correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm not able to say this right. So the way I saw it was, like, this was a way of living. Like this was their beliefs. This was their um. What is it called? Um, philosophical ideas. I'm pretty sure that's what many people call it. Because I saw the word uh, philosophical in the text, and I found it as like this was their way to find peace and balance within their own life, within their own like natural and religion, religious way. I guess. I know we talked about religion last time, but I don't know. I just want to tie that in because what Angel was talking about balance, it just reminded me of that. And I don't know. I just felt like I was able to say that right now. Yeah. Good call out. Thank you, Ernesto. Um, two, why is the elasticity of my eye important to understanding what my eye is? Or, or let's start with this. What is this term elasticity? What does that mean? Hmm. Um, I would say like elasticity is kind of um, like when you think of elasticity, you think of like a rubber band, something that's like able to be like stressed or like changed to like shape any kind of way that you um, would make it. And so I think like Ma'at is also kind of like it discuss the text like discussed how broad and how range it um it is in terms of like its ideals and how you interpret um its meanings. And so I think like um that like that elasticity helps you kind of make my art uh, your own. Um, like you take those principles or those values and uh, make it your own, or like you're able to be an individual with my art, even though there's like one main, like, I mean, well, there's like main ideas, but you can also make those ideas more um, tailored to your life and you as an individual. Thank you. I think uh, you provide us with a great uh, definition of elasticity and also kind of understanding how this um, speaks to the concept of my eye. Anyone else want to share as it pertains to the elasticity of my eye? 
to piggyback off of what Eric said, it's kind of like you can shape the like the views of Ma'at and make it your own with the principles that were given. So it's kind of like with this class, this is our class. Like you, like you're the one providing us the readings. We're the ones providing like the answers. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Can I go? Yeah. Uh, I was thinking like my Ma Ma was like very adaptable, but at the same time very flexible. Mm -hmm. Like it, it remains true to its like own like rules, like the truth, justice, and like balance of its rules. I like the um, notions of adaptability and flexibility. Perfect. Um, what questions did you did you all have about the reading? So someone mentioned that Ma'at was a goddess. Mm -hmm. Is is that true? Was she an actual woman, like a person, or was she just like a goddess that people like prayed to or worshipped? So it, it it's two things. Um, it's more of the latter in the sense of something that people pray to and worship, but more so above like praying and worshiping to it. It's a a moral guiding force, right? Like you didn't want to um, be foul the goddess Ma'at, right? But also, um, if you think back to um, Imhotep, right? And, I, and it talks about how he became Christ or one with Christ 200 years after his death. So there is this thing, um, Ma'at, M-A-A-T, Ma'at. Um, so there is this thing within comedic folklore to where if you do great feats, if you do something that's spectacular, you're able to earn God or goddess status, right? So um, I, I do want to, you know, make both of those realities known. Um, no, she wasn't like a living entity or a living person, but um, it wasn't beyond reason that a living being can be Author, author, authored into or um, author, uh, authorized into being a god or a goddess, right? So it could happen, but in the concept of Ma'at, in the case of Ma'at, she is more of an idea, a concept, principles. Um, but it's a, it's a feminine principle, so this is why it's the goddess instead of a god. Does that answer your question? Perfect. Any other questions you have? Uh, what other questions do you have about the reading? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ernesto. I didn't see your hand. It's not fully just a question about the reading, but just a question in general about this. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, since this was, you know, a while ago, and I'm pretty sure not many people will talk about it now, who really started this idea? Like, why, like, why was it brought up? Like, was there something that had to cause it? Was there, I don't know. I'm just very curious about, like, who really want to start this idea or the the belief or the what was i saying earlier the the thinking i guess yeah i don't know i just get very curious about everything that's why yeah it's it's hard to give you an approximate person or like an approximate date right but what i can do is direct you to last week's readings on um, the teaching of Hotep, right and one of his desires was to create a society that was strifeless right and he articulates doing that through the metu nefer through good speech but also within that the concept of ma'at appears right so I, I would argue that as old as comedic um, antiquity is this concept of ma'at is this is the guiding philosophical principle that structured that society right um so if you have to think about if this is the guiding principle that structures the Kemetic society, then you must look to the societies that came before Kemet. And that's typically the um, society of Nubia, which is to the south of Kemet, right? Um, so I would have to argue, and this is not with any um, hardcore research on my end, right? But just from what I know of Kemetic history and Kemetic folklore, um, all of the ideals out of Kemet stem from um, Nubia. Right. So I'm assuming and I'm approximating that um, this concept of Ma'at comes out of Nubia and then informs the way that the folks move in Kemet. That's the best answer I can kind of give to you without being like an Egyptologist or Kemetologist myself. Good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's get two more questions and then we'll move on. Preferably from someone we have not heard from. Um, I have a question. Um, since Ma'at 
was a concept how I, it stated that they were polytheists, if I remember correctly. So how how is that like how does that work? So okay, remember polytheism is the belief in one in multiple gods, right? And then Agnaton came and changed Kemet from a polytheistic society to a monotheistic society, right? So they went from believing in multiple gods, Ma'at being one of those many gods, to just believing in one god, which is Aten. This is also where the elasticity of Ma'at comes into play, right? Because whereas in a polytheistic society, Ma'at can serve as a goddess, right? Because there's belief in multiple gods, but because they shifted from a polytheistic society to a monotheistic society, and now we're only believing in one God, the elasticity of Ma'at comes into play because now she shifts from being just a uh, goddess, but to a more of a moral principle and a moral standard and, and kind of um, constructs on how to live a peaceful and wholesome life. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Perfect. One more question and we'll move on. I have a question. So um earlier we were talking about um Ma I think Mont being a god. I'm kind of confused. So like how can it so like I get I really understand how it's an idea, but I don't understand how like at the same time it could be a god. Okay. So check it. Are you a re religious person? Uh I practice my religion, yes. So what's your religion? Islam. Islam, okay. So Allah, right? That's, yeah. that's yeah. God, correct? Right. But isn't the notion of Allah also an idea? Yeah, in a way it could be. Right? So the same is true for Ma'at, right? Um, think about the relationship between Allah and the decisions that you make right? You don't want to make a decision that would offend Allah, right? So right. that course corrects your decision making in the way that you interact with people. So not only does God, in your case, Allah, right, serve as your Godhead, but also it structures how you move and how you treat people, which makes it a moral standard and a moral code. You see how those two interplay, where you can serve as both God and as well, or God and as an idea that produces a certain standard of living. I do better now. But it's still a little unclear to you, or is it clear? I mean, it's just like I get, I got it when you explained it using my religion, but like it's kind of new to me. So it's like it's new to me. I get what you're saying, but like it's just a little like still rough to understand yeah. um and, and i think ultimately i think we have to kind of move beyond trying to position this as a religion right um it's not really there i mean to be call it what it is right there was no such thing as religion as we understand it then right like it's more about creating a lifestyle. It's more about a, a spiritual relationship. And in this case, this spiritual relationship structures how you interact with people, right? Um, okay, but is there any other questions, comments, or concerns before I jump into my lecture? Oh, go, go ahead, Jaden. So I just have the question of, is it like, so let's say in like Africa, right? Like there's like, let's say like, an Egyptian person, would they be classified as African or is that two different, like separate things? Like there's a difference between like being Egyptian and being African or are they both in the same category as in like, you can consider them as like African too? Okay, I think that's a contested question, right? Uh, if you talk to a lot of the modern day Egyptians, they would say that they're Egyptian and not African, right? Um, but if you understand the history of Egypt or Kemet, therefore, and this is why I'm, I'm very... I'm um, careful about using those terms specifically, right? Because once, so before I go there, one, where is Egypt and what, in what continent? Africa. Okay, right. So there, there's no confusion about that, right? Yeah. Like, like we cannot, we cannot um, play the let's move the country game, right? Like, because a lot of Western scholars seek to kind of move Egypt out of Africa. They don't want to try to make it part of like um, the Islamic North, um, you know, the Arabic world. But no, it's very much within Africa, right? Um, but what happens is because of migration, right? People from um, 
Europe, people from Asia coming into Kemet at the time when it was Kemet, just like in any type of migration, you start to what? Intermingle, you know? And now you create, from if you think back from the lecture we had a couple of weeks ago, this idea of the, the Semite, right? These mixed people. So now you have these Semitic people also occupying this territory. And um, the rulers of Kemet, just like any society, it changes, right? And it goes from being a black ruled society to an Asian ruled society. Then through wars, black folks reclaimed it. And then through wars, Greeks came and reclaimed it, right? And then through wars, Arabic descended people claimed it, right? So this is why it's a very hard question to ask because of all of the mixing and mingling that produces Kemet how, or Egypt, how we now see it, right? Um, but the origins, right, these historical concepts like Ma'at, the, the structuring of the pyramids, right, these um, philosophical and spiritual standards that um, Kemet is known for, those are purely African intervention, inventions, right? Like those didn't come when um, how we think of Egyptians now were ruling Egypt, right? Like those are, are hundreds of thousands of years prior to that, you know? Um, so I, I think it's... Um, while I understand why historically folks who live in Egypt would not consider themselves African, right? Just like folks who here in America don't consider them, Black folks here in America won't consider themselves Africans, the same type of dis dissonance, right? Um, but what you can't do and what history seeks to do is displace the African origins of Kemet and call it something else. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, 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 I'm starting to get a little bit more now. Thank you. This is a, that's a good question. Um, any other questions, comments, or concerns? Do people still use the basic concept of Maat today in ancient Egypt? Um, I you know I don't I haven't been to Kemet. I haven't um in, engaged with too many um Egyptian people to know you know how um fluid this concept is currently. Um, I think it's kind of become a relic you know, um, something that just kind of sits in the museums and not really given the proper um, credence to as, as it's for its ability to shape the world, right? So I, I would, if I had to guess, I would say no, just because um, one thing's for sure, right? Um, capitalism and the cult culture of capitalism is, is very much in conflict with the ideals of Ma'at. And I don't see how... Um, a nation as modern and technologically advanced and capitalistic as Egypt, um, really operating through this, this concept of my eye. It just to me, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous contradiction. I don't know how it would be done. It's a good question though. Okay. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit of the book. Um, I wanna read a little bit of the introduction just to kind of give you a, a context of what the book is talking about and the um, ideas and the aims of the author. Um, the author of the text is Maulana Karenga. He is the chair of the Pan-African Studies Department or the Africana Studies Department at Cal State Long Beach. So he is very much accessible. He's very much um, live and thriving and well. Um, this is from the introduction. It says, first, this project is essentially a project of moral philosophy and the notion of ideal or paradigm serves this interest. Secondly, I hold that an accurate delineation of the moral ideal is fundamentally contrib contributive to a critical understanding and discussion of the ancient Egyptians assumed practice. Thirdly, the ideal expressed in the literature is more readily accessible and saves one from problematic claims about practices which are often, which are, sorry, which often are at best only speculative and at worst pre um, pre producer, pre judicial and reductive, right? So it's kind of giving you an idea of what he would like to get out of the text. So starting with this idea of Ma'at as a conceptual ideal, okay? So this is the concept of Ma'at. I'm looking at page five under um, the section 1.2, Ma'at, the conceptual idea. And it says, actually, this conceptual elasticity at which at first glance might seem problematic um, on deeper inquiry proves promising due to what Morin's 1984 page 16 calls Ma'at's rich treasury of meaning, right? So what he's saying is because of Ma'at being so elastic, right? Being able to be shaped, being able to be molded, being that is malleable, right? That may seem problematic for trying to understand 
with my eye it, right? But this author Morins, which is the last name, you see the parentheses, uh, the year 1984, which is the year that this text that Morin wrote was published. And then 16 lets you know the page number that that was take, um, taken from, right? We know that Morin's calls Ma'at a rich treasury of meaning, right? So it has multiple meanings. For here, one encounters in Ma'at with Kua, another author. This book is written in 1978 on page 138, defines as plurigination, which, which allows for and encourages a wide range of thoughts and interpretations, right? So again, it can be thought about in a variety of ways. Moreover, within the framework of a modernistic ontology, which as Ferdinand, another author, 1985, 1986, and 1989 notes, is central to the comedic worldview, the conceptual elast elasticity of Ma'at as a category of interrelated ethical, social, religious, political, and or natural order sign significance proves invaluable, right? So part of the elasticity of Ma'at, right? And this is pulled from the author's Morins, the author's Kua, and the author's Feinstead, right? That the elasticity comes from the inter interrelated categories of the ethical, the social, the religious, the political, and the natural, right? These are the four categories that allows Ma'at to kind of be um, shape-shifted into these four, five different um, realms, if you will. On page six, the start of the second paragraph, it says the etymology of Ma'at. What does the etymology mean again? What, is it, what does this term etymology mean? And we used it when we talked about Kemet, right? And we said that the etymology of Kemet means the black land. So what is this term etymology? Is it, I'm sorry, is it like the, um, like understanding like the language or like the origin of like where the word came from? Origin of the word, right? You understand the origin of the word in order to derive the meaning of the word. So the etymology of Ma'at suggests an evolution from a physical concept of straightness, evenness, levelness, correctness, as the wedge-shaped glyph suggests. So uh, early on, right, originally, Ma'at was considered to be a physical concept, right? A physical concept of straightness, of evenness, of levelness, of correctness, right? So think about um, architecture, right? Think about um, building of things, right? Think about the building of the pyramids. If you're going to do these type of buildings in a comedic standpoint, this building should be done and constructed in a way that's maotic, right? The pillars should be straight. The, um, the concrete that you're using should be even, right? This is the original way that maot was understood as a physical concept, right? A material concept, something that structures the way things are, are built, right? Um, Okay, to a general concept of rightness. So it evolves from this physical concept to just a general idea of when you hear ma'a, it means something that's done right or something that's done correct, right? Including the ontological and ethical sense of truth, justice, righteousness, order. In a word, the rightness of things. Right. So it, got, it evolves from being a physical thing, a way that you understand to build something or to make something in a way that's maotic, that's straight, that's even. Right. To an overall idea of a thing being done right. OK, so that's the evolution of this. Um, this term my eye. Um, looking at page seven on the top opening paragraph of the first full paragraph, he says, he goes on to note that in addition to Ma'at as an epistemological or philosophical idea, a moral idea and a metaphysical idea, okay? So we have um, philosophical, right? So in the, as it pertains to philosophy, right? Um, a moral idea, so as it, to, as it pertains to being moral and, and, and acting with morals, right? And then a metaphysical idea. So an idea that's be beyond the physical, the idea that goes into the immaterial, the idea that goes into the spirit, right? This is part of this evolution of Ma'at. Um, in as much as the ideal of Ma'at 
oh, I'm sorry, uh, a, a metaphysical idea. It is, in a real sense, also an ecological idea. In as much as the idea of Ma'a opposes all enterprises which tend to destroy the cosmic order, nature, and thereby commits itself to the future or destiny of humanity. Right. So not only is it con uh, concerned with the physical, not only is it concerned with the ecological. Right. Um, sorry. Not only is it considered with the, the metaphysical and the physical, it's also concerned with the ecological. Right. So how is nature impacted? Right. So things like polluting the ozone layer is not in alignment with my. Eye, right. Things like um, the smog that, you know, gets produced and, and goes into our atmosphere, that's not being in alignment with my from an ecological standpoint, right? Dumping waste in the ocean and things of that nature would not be in alignment with my right? Because it does not allow for um, the future or, or the embitterment or the destiny of humanity, right? It's, it's out of pocket with that. Um, towards the bottom of the page, um, the last full paragraph, starting with finally. I'm um, going into, is a, well, I'll start with finally. Um, finally, Obendanga, 1990, page 158, affirms the wide range of interrelated meanings of the Ma'atan ideal, noting that the notion of Ma'at is complex and the meanings of Ma, um, sorry, is complex and rich. It is expressive in four basic areas. So these are four basic areas that you can understand Ma'at. And again, this kind of speaks to the elasticity of Ma'at. The universal domain um, in which ma'at is le tot or donde, the totality of ordered existence, right? So in the universal capacity, everything that is in order, that exists within order, is considered to be ma'atic, right? So the way that the stars, the constellations, the oceans, all of these things are set in place in the universal capacity speaks to this idea of this notion of ma'at, right? The political domain in which Ma'at is, um, rep sorry, the political domain in which Ma'at is justice and in the opposition to injustice, right? So if you're going to do anything concerning politics from a Ma'atic standpoint, it must be just and it must abhor, it must hate injustice, right? So if you think about our current um, justice system, right, if you think about our political system, how much is it involved with making sure that justice is spread out or employed, right? Very little to do with justice in our current political system, right? Um, so these are the, the way that Ma'at can be looked at from a universal standpoint and a political standpoint, okay? The third domain is the social domain in which the focus is on right relation and duty in the context of community. So for the third domain, for me, that is the teachers of Patahotep, right? The teaching of, of Patahotep is written um, with the desire to make sure that the social domain of Ma'at is held intact, right? This is why good speech becomes important because it makes sure that harmony and order, which are two principles of Ma'at, are in, in place. And then finally, um, the personal domain in which following the rules and principles of Ma'at is to realize concretely the universal order in oneself to live in harmony with the ordered whole, right? So again, from a personal standpoint, you want to make sure that your actions are in alignment with Ma'at, right? That your actions are truthful, are just, are harmonious, are balanced, are ordered, are reciprocity. So what others do for you, you're willing to do for others, right? These are how you can make sure that the way that you are moving is in alignment with the way and the order of the universal, right? That way that you're um, in harmony with the way that nature and universe has been designed from a divine creation standpoint, right? So again, the four um, domains is the universal, right? Making sure that everything in the universe is aligned in the standpoint that is ma'atic. The political domain, making sure that your politics are hyper-concerned with um, justice. And then the third being the social domain, making society is um, having good relations um, and, and focusing on the embitterment of the community. And then finally, the personal domain, making sure that your actions, your thoughts, your words, right, how you treat people are in alignment with this concept or this notion of my eye. Um, looking at page eight, the second full paragraph where it says Ma'at as a principle, 
Ma'at as a principle and force constitutive of creation itself comes to mean then an order of rightness which permeates existence and gives life. Thus, Siegfried Morenz, 1984, page 113 states, Ma'at is right order in nature and society as established by the act of creation and hence means according to context, which is right, which is correct, law, order, justice, and truth. Also stresses the centrality of Ma'at as a divinely constituted order, right? So not only does it, make sure that again the political and the social are in order right but this is something that has been given to us from the divine this is something that has been given to us from allah this is something that has been given to us from the creator from abu tala from god whatever form of god you understand it to be you know that ma'ad has come from that source right so it's a divine concept um uh, Okay, I, I'll, I'll end with this one. I'm looking at page 10. Um, the key point, and this is the second paragraph on page 10, starting with the key point of this discussion, then is that the practice of Ma'at is conceived and carried out within the worldview, which links the divine, the natural, and the social. These three domains are interrelated, interactive, and mutually affective. And a Ma'atan person understands this and acts accordingly as the history of the idea of Ma'at, which presented below, which is presented below demonstrates, right? So one he says, if you are a person who abides by Ma'at and you're a practitioner of trying to live a life that's Ma'atic, right? You understand that the divine, the natural and the social are all connected, right? So however you understand God is connected to nature which is connected to our social reality, our society, right? These things aren't separate. They all inform one another, right? And once you have this understanding, then you can begin to live a life and practice a life that can be considered ma'atik. Um, I'm gonna put the lecture on hold. Uh, we'll open it up to the fishbowl. Remember, you have to do two fishbowls per semester. Um, you have one time to pass. You could talk about your journal, or you could talk about the breakout room questions, or you could read, uh, or you could um, talk about what I discussed in this um, brief lecture. Are there any volunteers for the fishbowl? Okay, Kevin, I think this will be your second one, correct? Yeah, it was so my second one. Technically, you would be done for the semester. You've gotten all your particip participation credits, but it's not that it eliminates you from participating in the fishbowl, okay? Okay. Anyone else want a fishbowl? And if not, I'll call that random. All right, calling that random. Um, Kyle, were you putting your, fish, uh, your hand up to the fishbowl? Yes, sir. Okay, I got you. So I got Kevin and Kyle. Um, we'll get one more person. Um, Ernesto. Ernesto, is this your second one also? Yeah, I was doing the fishbowl last time with Kevin. So Ernesto and Kevin are done for the semester. Uh, we'll get one more because I would like to have a little more gender balance in here. Um, is there any women who would like to volunteer for the fishbowl? All right, so then I'll call that random. Um, Melanie Mendez, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Can I ask for this one? Uh, you can, but just remember, like, if you do, you it's the whole semester, you've already used that one pass. And it, just to remind you, right, you have your journal you can pull from, you talk about what was discussed in your breakout questions, or anything that stood out to you in the lecture, you could be used for your fishbowl participation. If you want to pass? Yes. I can go. I'm sorry, who said they can go? Who was that? Amanda. Amanda, okay, give me one second, Amanda, I got you. Let me just write Melanie down. All right, so we have uh, Kevin, Kyle, Ernesto, and Amanda will be fishbowling. Who would like to start us off? Uh, I'll start off. Um, so in page 11, the second paragraph, when it says the first assumption then it is, is that one's tradition, which is uh, at the core of one's stance, is what Alas there, in 1981, 139, calls the moral standing point for philosophical eth ethics and serves as the foundation. Um, 
that stuck out to me because it's like it's kind of like the building blocks of ma so it's like it's the tradition and it's like this is the foundation this is the middle ground and then this is the top thing and it's kind of like a pyramid that they're building and, and just to, to point out and to make it clear right this is the starting point for philosoph for philosophical ethics so anytime yes. that you get into philosophy, right, and you're talking about this ethics, this notion of ethics, and a good way to understand ethics from a philosophical standpoint is like this term of the way things should be, right? Ought. Ought is an ethical term, right? Politics ought to be done like this. And then you're dealing with ethics, right? So what they're saying is the foundation to philosophical ethics is my ought, right? The yeah. how based on what should be done and how it should be done is my eye. So anytime like you're it. dealing with philosophy and anytime you're dealing with ethics within philosophy, the starting point is <laughs> Did you want to say something else, Kevin? Sorry, I had to switch airplanes because one of them died. Uh, but it's kind of like saying that like my eye is like the like founding block of like philosophy. Like point blank. Yes. Yep. Especially when you're dealing with um, ethics, right? You cannot dismiss the role of my eye as it pertains to ethics. Um, Kyle, you're up next. Give me one second. I'll be right back. One second. My bad, John. Tia's just gone from school. Um, I'm sorry. So, Kevin, you're up next. I just went. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Kyle, you're up next. Excuse me, Kyle. Hello. I'll be um, reading a little part from my journal entry. Perfect. So, I wrote that... Um, the meaning of maha is that it's not a specified teaching, but rather an idea or way of living that is ever changing to be in harmony with our God, society, and nature. And I wrote that this idea is further supported by the following line on page five, which stated, what is offered, therefore, is not so much a detailed document of things to do and not do, but a framework of possibility, a unity of focus, a point of orientation and reference for a diversity of action leading to an ideal achievement. And I also wrote that this means God did not specify how humans shall pursue their life. Instead, we are offered guidance through text. When the author mentions a lack of detail in this document, in this document, it may symbolize that God intended for humans to decide what their purpose and morality is. Uh, Kevin, that's a, I thought, Kyle. Um, it's a great journal entry from what I've heard so far, right? You provide us with the thesis. You provide us with your analysis of how you came to understand um, this concept of my eye. Um, I love the notion of a framework for possibility, right? Um, and when you think about that and you think about this notion of it being elastic and it being able to be shaped and molded and shifted, right? That means that possibilities are endless, right? There is no real limitation that you could put on one, the concept of my eye, or two, the ability to be righteous, to be moral, to be correct right? To live a life that's good. There's no limits to that. And it's to provide you a framework for what is possible as it pertains to goodness. I think that's a really, really brilliant call out. Thank you. Um, Ernesto. Um, so I had an idea earlier, but after hearing, I just wanted to add on or like at least talk about what you and Kevin were talking about, about ethics. So I wanted to make a connection to high school and when I took my psychology class in high school, this was 11th grade. And when we were taught about ethics, we weren't taught a simple thing about what we were just taught today, which was my and how ethics was basically a starting point with this in this era, as I call era. But um, I found it interesting that the idea of ethics wasn't even around, and yet this was the starting point. This was 
like where we've all gotten the idea of ethics because ethics isn't used so much in today's world at least that i see it's kind of just brushed off and a lot of people that even read about it think about it for a second and just let it go i mean even in high school i didn't really think about the idea as much and yeah i just really wanted to talk about that and talk about how maybe ethics could be used again if others were able to at least look into the idea of not but yeah, I just want to throw the idea out. And, and I think we also what you provide us, Ernesto, is a contemporary analysis, right? So if Ma'at is old as ancient African antiquity, right? What Ernesto is trying to think, get us to think about is how can we apply this concept to our world now, right? And how in doing so, does that shape the ethics of our world, right? Will it allow us to be a more ethical society if we were to implement notions of Ma'at? I think that's a brilliant um, way of producing a contemporary analysis. Um, Amanda. So I'm gonna be reading some of my journal as well. So my thesis is that Ma'at centers around the practice of the good and its meaning for the divine, social and natural. And it refers to the diversity of actions that lead us to ideal achievement. I also wanna note that I agree with the assumption that tradition is the moral starting point for ethics. I feel like tradition is very important in someone's life and how they were raised. And the seven principles of Ma'at are truth, justice, harmony, balance, order, propriety, and reciprocity. And basically, I also wrote that Ma'at is how someone maintains their morality. Some Ma'at laws uh, include the act of not sinning, not stealing, not killing, and not lying also very similar to what's written in the Bible. Wanted to note that. Um, but one of my questions was, I didn't really understand what, like about the political domain and what counts as an injustice in that domain. So for example, Amanda, um, George Floyd, did he receive justice? No. Right. So within the, political domain right our political system says that you are your rights guarantee you to be a, to a trial right trial by the jury of your peers right um part of the way that you are placed into custody you have to have your miranda rights read to you right these are the the, the laws that are set in place by our government to make sure that um all citizens have this equal experience within the justice system, right? George yeah. Floyd didn't get a trial. I don't even believe his Miranda rights were read to him, right? Mm -hmm. So we see within our society, the lack of political ethics produces an unjust political system, right? Um, juxtapose, so we have George Floyd on one side of the category, then I'm going to go to Kyle Rittenhouse. Do you know who Kyle Rittenhouse is? I don't. Eric, do me a favor and explain to the class who Kyle Rittenhouse is. Um, I may be wrong with some of these details, but I do remember he was like, um, like the really like high profile case about, um, I think it was in, was it Wisconsin? Um, where uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, he shot um two i believe it was two african americans at um i can't remember where it was at but i think it was during um like a riot or some kind of like um uh like group of like i can't remember it, it might have been like a riot or, or a protest and he shot two african american people and, and uh i believe a white boy also he got shot right but, yeah. but so like a little more context right i don't believe he's 18 or he may just have been 18. Um, he's from Ohio, drives down, no, I'm sorry, he's from Chicago, drives from Chicago to Ohio with an AR-15, right? And is, not only does he shoot three people, right? He is almost guided by the police to go pull off this heinous act, right? And then he's able to drive himself back home across state lines to Chicago after shooting three people, right? He didn't get arrested? No, he did That's not. Insane. 
So this question of justice, this question of justice in the realm of politics, right? You see what injustice is like. It's, it's proliferated all through our, our society. We know what that like is like. And I, I would even argue, Amanda, the reason why you're having a car, hard time understanding this notion of um, justice is because you live in America, one of the most politically unjust countries that there is, right? Yeah. Um, so what justice may look like is George Floyd actually being able to get a trial or not to be fucked with. Right. Because really, at the end of the day, what did he do to deserve to die? Nothing. The rumor is he was selling loose cigarettes. That's worth your life. How about we create a society to where someone is not is not so impoverished that they have to resort to selling loose cigarettes just to make ends meet? That would be a just political society. Right. Justice for Kyle Rittenhouse would be you shoot somebody, homie, your ass is going to jail. Regardless of what you look like, regardless of how um, or how less melanated you are, right? You have to go through the protocol like everyone else who commits a crime, right? So that's what justice would look like from a political standpoint if we were to invoke Ma'at. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead, Amanda, go ahead. No, I was saying thank you for explaining. Um, so we have about a few more minutes left. Uh, we'll open it up to um, comments, questions, concerns, just anything that you guys want to talk about as it pertains to the reading, the lecture, the breakout rooms, or the fishbowl. It's open for anyone to discuss. Um, I wanted to jump on like on the fishbowl. Um, this is something I took out from the lecture reading. Um, you said, um, from I think you mentioned the personal standpoint, and you also mentioned um, creating a harmony. And... Um, like everything in the universe being aligned. And Ma also talks about like society. So I wanted to talk about how that ties to social etiquette. And um, I wonder if like Ma was the beginning of social etiquette. If that's kind of my question. You know, I, again, just with me not being a, a, a historian, I can't say like from historical perspective, right? But I, I think you're spot on, Angel, in your assessment in the sense that what my I was concerned about from, especially from the social domain, right? Like we have, we know there's various domains that my I occupies, but from the social domain was ensuring that there was positive and productive relations. So I, I think it would be correct to assume then that Ma'at was the first social etiquette standard in the world, right? Uh, if, we're, if we're gonna say that this is one of the oldest and first civilizations, then you would have to say that this was the social ethic that grounded that civilization. So it would be safe to argue that, you know, this is one of those first social ethical principles that kind of helped shape the way that people interacted with one another. I think that's a great, great question. I think it's a fair, it's a, it would be fair to say yes. I think um, to borrow a phrase from the teacher's Patahotep, right? Without compelling evidence otherwise, I haven't came across a uh, social ethics that predates ancient comedic society. But again, I'm not a historian, so I can't, you know, I'll put the asterisks on it. Thank you. Fabian, what are you thinking or feeling? Um, I think, uh, I think all this is, well, yeah, I think all this is, um, pretty interesting hearing about, uh, well, I'm not too, like, I'm a little bit off today, I'm a little bit tired, but, um, judging from what I'm hearing, um, all this sounds pretty interesting it's just that um i'm a little bit off today mr i'm sorry huh? i got you uh, but, uh yeah that's pretty interesting fair enough uh marlene what are you thinking of feeling to tovar verdugo yeah thank you what are you thinking of feeling? Um, I think how it's interesting how everyone has a different interpretation of uh, Ma'a and how they implement it into their daily lives, I guess. I, I think also that speaks to its elasticity, right? Like you could have different 
interpretations of it, but it all leads to you being a good and moral person, right? And treating people well. So yeah, you definitely is, I think that's a good call out as well. Um, one more and we'll call it a day. Uh, who have we not heard from? Uh, Danielle, Daniel, excuse me, Daniel, what are you thinking of film? Well, right now, uh, I just think it's like really interesting about how um, these like uh, the um, the mat is like something that it's like, again, like it's like the beginnings, I think you said of like uh, ethics or something like that, but it's like something we never learned about or weren't taught about like in school which is i think would be something like important to learn about let me ask you this daniel and we'll end with this and if daniel we could pull from someone else if daniel doesn't have an answer for him why do you think we don't learn about this in school why do you think this is not taught mm -hmm. I'm not really sure. Kevin, what do you think? It's because um, the school system, they give teachers a specific like book or a specific teaching that they have to do. So although if a teacher really wants to like actually show the history and like the meaning of it, they legally cannot because they're given what they're given. Yeah, and and I think on a on a deeper level, right? That like that's like the concrete practical answer. But on a deeper level, it's hard to say that African people are inhuman if you know that the first moral concept that came that was produced on the planet comes out of Africa. It's hard to say that um, the Greeks and the Romans were the first philosophers if you know that the whole ethical concept of philosophy comes out of this African concept, which is ma'at. Right. So to teach these type of things in school is to erode the whole moral fiber of what this society and this oligarchy we call America is grounded and, and founded upon. Right. So we can't have these type of dark truths um, be made reticent in classrooms because it then undermines and starts to disrupt everything that we are been conditioned to believe in and pledge our allegiance to. Does that make sense? So for next week, we'll continue um, with our conversation on Ma'at. We'll cover the um, second and third portion of the of the reading. Um, and then that will be on Monday. We'll finish Ma'at. Um, Wednesday will be, oh, dope. On Wednesday, we have Pat Maladoma Patrice Omey of Wire and Spirit. But I'll, I'll, I'll highlight that for you on next Monday after we complete Ma'at. Um, other than that, I hope you all have a good rest of your week. Have a good weekend. And I will see you all on Monday. Peace. Thank you. Welcome.